In the name of the Father, and of the Father, Son, and of the, Son, Holy, Spirit. And of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Amen. Lord, let us draw near with the true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your present and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto you all. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. We join together in singing our opening hymn, The Advent of Our King, which will be followed by the Kyrie as printed in your bulletins. Great. 
gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the first Sunday in Advent is from Isaiah, chapter 64. Oh, that you may rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for them who wait for him. You meet him who joyfully works righteousness, those who remember you in your ways. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins, we have been a long time and shall we be saved? We all have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls upon your name, who rouses himself to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us, and you made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter, we are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read together responsively Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. You who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever, world without end. Amen. Today's epistle is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge. Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift, as you, uh, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, In those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved in the Lord, let us continue to love one another, that united as one people in Christ Jesus our Lord, we might confess together our common Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join together in singing our sermon hymn based on our Old Testament reading for this morning, O Savior, Rend the Heavens Wide. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We are told by experts that you should not stare at the sun during a solar eclipse. And yet every time a solar eclipse happens, there is at least one person that's going to try and do that and partially burn out their retinas. Because even though the sun is obscured partly by the moon, you are still getting the full effects of the corona. And the sun is a powerful source of energy, powerful source of light, staring right at it can take away your vision. Sometimes you only see the truth and light by approaching it from the side, much like we do with a pinhole camera or looking at the sun through some kind of a reflection. You squint around the corner. You look at it obliquely so that you don't get hit by the full force and have it, maybe even worse to take away your vision, kill you. That is what stories, what parables, what proverbs do in scripture. They keep us from staring directly at the sun, at the unmitigated light of the Lord, and see him, if you will, around a corner or in a mirror, so that instead of being blinded, we're able to perceive him in a way that's appropriate for us as fallen human beings. Take C.S. Lewis's books, for example. In the Narnia Chronicles, the Lord is pictured as a giant lion, the son of the emperor over the sea. 
And when the four kids from London enter through the wardrobe into the land of Narnia, they encounter an evil white witch, a frozen land, and yes, even talking animals, including, warms the heart of Canadians, two beavers. And as the beavers and the kids end up having a conversation, they talk about this Lord, this Aslan. And one of the kids finds out that Aslan is a lion, a great lion, and says, oh, I... I thought he'd be a man. Is he quite safe? Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. The question for all of us on this first Sunday of Advent that the Lord is asking us through the prophet Isaiah and through Jesus himself in his words in Matthew's gospel is whether we treat God as safe or do we recognize that he is good? Do we wish that God would just rend the heavens and come down? And if we do, do we know what that really means? Are we prepared to look at the light of Christ in his fullness or God in his fullness? Isaiah writes more than 700 years before the time of Christ. He is a prophet during and after the time of King Uzziah. And King Uzziah, during Isaiah's younger years and childhood, was a great king and brought to Israel a great time of prosperity. The rich were getting richer, but the poor were getting poorer. There was peace in general, but always war on the horizon. And religiously, while there was a great temple, there was an increasing feeling that anything goes, because what are the gods going to do about it? So Isaiah writes in chapter 2, You, Lord, have rejected your people, the house of Jacob, because they are full of things from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines, and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. Their land is filled with silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is filled with horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. Now, does that sound at all familiar? A land where the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, there's peace but war on the horizon, and religiously anything goes? And so Isaiah's cry to the Lord in this kind of a time, in this period of great economic disparity and religious immorality, if you will, was that God would rend the heavens and come down. Shake the people up. Wake the people up from their stupor. Make his name known and make the nations tremble before the God of Israel. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, and that the nations might tremble at your presence. Oh, if only God would just come and just prove to all of these people in their laziness that he was the God and that he would come and make everything just again. Of course, the problem with calling down God is much the same as the problem of staring at the sun or trying to look at something really bright directly. Number one, it might burn you out. And number two, God might actually do it. Do you really want to stare into the face of the eternal one? the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the one who calls galaxies into existence by a mere word. Do you really want him to come down here? And could you stare into his face if he did? The people who might have become closest to this in history were the people of Israel at Mount Sinai as God descended on the mountain in thunder and lightning, still veiling himself and yet powerfully present. And the people of Israel, even with that veiled encounter with God, cried out and said, we don't ever want to see God face to face this close again. 
And so in Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses speaks to the people these words, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, it is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. We don't want to stare into the sun anymore. We don't want God to rend the heavens and come down. And so Moses goes on to say, the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So, those of you who've been listening to the Gospels, lo, these many years, when Jesus asks people who they think he is, and they answer, the prophet, that's who they're talking about. That's why it says, the prophet, and not just a prophet, that perhaps Jesus is the fulfillment of this promise that the Lord made through Moses, that no more would people stare directly into the face of God. No more would they have to worry about the God, Lord of Sabaoth, rending the heavens and coming down, but that he would come among his people as one of them, someone we could listen to and look at and not die. Today we enter into the season of Advent. Lots of purple at the front, purple over here, purple the color of royalty, purple the color of a coming king. Also the color of Lent, because Advent and Lent are both penitential seasons. Seasons of reflection on the goodness of the king and sometimes the not-so-goodness of his subjects. The one-year church lectionary, which we don't use, but that a lot of churches in the Caribbean do use, has a pre-Lenten season. You have the Sundays of Lent, the five of them, and then three pre-Lent Sundays, because, you know, can never have too much penitentialness, right? That's got to work a little bit extra in. And in much the same way, the last three Sundays of the church year that we just went through served as a kind of pre-Advent and the first Sunday of Advent continues their theme, which is the end, the judgment, the time when God will rend the heavens and come down the way that he sort of did at Hora, but in an even more magnified way. So our gospel reading for the first Sunday of Advent is, is not exactly in keeping with the Christmas spirit, which often strikes people as a little bit odd. We don't decorate our houses with bloody moons and darkened suns and quaking things. It's not how we film our holiday specials either, which are always filled with goodness and light and clouds and fluffy bunnies and Santa Claus. But instead, on this very first Sunday of Advent, Jesus says, in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. The only thing that's really Christmassy about our gospel reading for today is be on guard, keep awake like a child on Christmas morning, not being able to get to sleep, but laying there just waiting, waiting, waiting for the moment when they can get up and go and see what Santa's brought them. But God coming down the chimney, that would be a terror. God coming down and rending the heavens in his own self would be frightening, especially if you're not ready for it. And this is precisely the point of this morning. It's the point of Advent. It's the point of the Christian life. It's getting us ready for the time when God will, as the Lord of Sabaoth, rend the heavens and come down. From the picture of heavens rended and darkened suns and blooded moons to a call to watch the fig trees and stay awake at the door to John the Baptist preparing the way for the Lord in the desert, we are getting ready so that when the Lord comes, it will not be as a terror, but we will receive him as our king. We will receive him in blessing. And in order that that might happen, before the Lord 
as Lord of Sabaoth, as the Lord of judgment, as the one who darkens the sun and bloodies the moon comes down, he sends first one who is like us. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it is to him you shall listen. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. He comes first as a baby, a child, a young man with no form that we should desire him, who comes, in his own words, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He comes as a man who is baptized by the one who was sent to prepare a way in the wilderness for the Lord. And God does rend the heavens and come down, but as a dove, as a promise, that when the Lord comes down on us in our baptisms, it is not just to wipe out sin, but to forgive and to reconcile and to make us one with himself, that we might be ready to meet him on the last day. And near the end of his earthly life, this prophet, this Lord Jesus, doesn't call down 10,000 legions of his father's angels in a fit of righteous anger against the idolatry and squabbles and inattentiveness to his will of the people around us. He lets us nail him to a cross that we might be forgiven. And finally answers after 700 years Isaiah's prayer. But now, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O oh Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they are doing. And he stretched out his hands and said, Peace be with you. And then they were glad when they saw the Lord. And the last Jesus rises from the dead and ascends to the right hand of the Father, so that when God rends the heavens again on the last day and comes down, you and I will behold not a terrifying, unsafe God, but a good God who loved us even unto death. A God who came down first as a child, before he would need to come down in judgment. It's probably not a surprise to any of you that I'm a fan of science fiction and fantasy. Our imaginations are a gift that comes from God to imagine what we cannot now see. And Christians do often have to use their imagination because there's a lot in scripture that isn't fully painted out. One of my favorite shows from childhood and got rebooted a number of years ago, so it's still on the air after over 50 years, is Doctor Who, which introduces us to a race of time lords. And with every passing year of the more than 50 plus years the show's been on the air, we learn a little bit more about this great mystery of the time lords and, and how it is that a child grows up to become a master of time. And once a few years ago in a show, the doctor was asked how his age-old adversary, the master, became who he was, and he answers both his own origin and his with these words. Some say it all began as a child. That's when the master saw eternity. As a novice, he was taken for initiation, and he stood in front of the untempered schism. It's a gap in the fabric of reality through which can be seen the whole of the vortex. You stand there, eight years old, staring at the raw power of time and space, just a child. Some would be inspired, some would run away, and some would just go mad. The master went mad, the doctor ran away. But ultimately the problem was they were not ready to stare into the face of eternity. And neither are we. We as mortal sinful beings are not ready for God to rend the heavens and come down as the God who brought all of the galaxies into existence, as the God who spoke, let there be light, as the one who commands the hosts of armies of angels. If we were to stare at that God, would be we would be just as spiritually, mentally, and physically blinded as we would be physically blinded by staring into the sun. 
And that is why eternity first comes down to us as a child. Not to come with the law, but to come full of grace and truth. That we might come to know God first in the face of Jesus Christ. And come to know God first as the one who forgives. Before God must come down as the one to render judgment. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For unashamed hope in the Lord's return, that sustained by his Holy Spirit, we may have joy at the advent of Christ our Savior. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church, as she enters another church year, that God would enrich his saints in every way. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For Matthew, our Synod President, Waldemar, our District President, James, our Circuit Visitor, and all pastors in Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all Christians that called into the fellowship of God's Son, we would be sustained in our hope as we wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For husbands and wives, that they would live in love and service to each other, for fathers and mothers, that they would bring up their children in the fear and instruction of the Lord. And for all children, that honoring their parents, they would be well equipped for service to their neighbors in this life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our governing authorities, that peace and order would be preserved in our nations. For Her Majesty the Queen, for Justin, Francois, Martin and Alden, our national and provincial leaders for our military and police, all other civil servants, as well as all newly elected officials in our countries, and for a spirit of unity and cooperation among the peoples of our lands and the nations of the world, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all those in any danger, trouble, sickness, or need, especially Tony, Anna, Carrie, Olive, Paul, Herb, Lila, Ray, Juliet, and for all whom we name in our hearts before you this morning. For an end to the pandemic and for those who mourn that they would hope confidently in the resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may hold fast to the words of Christ's supper and that no human thinking may obscure his testament by which the true body and blood of Christ are eaten for the forgiveness of sins, that God would sustain us in repentance and saving faith, united in a true confession, and always awake, watching for Christ's return. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.